I was asked to give a talk on the definition and the differential diagnosis of Dravet syndrome. And I will have some overlap with the elegant talk you just heard from Dr. Dravet. Since the definition of Dravet syndrome, you really do look have, you have to look at the evolution of Dravet syndrome a bit through the years. I do some research with GW Pharma on their work with cannabidiol as well as Zogenics in the upcoming trials, or the current trials, I should say, with fenfluramine. So to begin, it's, it's impossible to give a definition of Dravet syndrome in one sentence because it is just too complex. If we start in a grand, broad view, then it's an epilepsy syndrome with intractable seizures and cognitive, motor, and behavior concerns that's highly associated with a sodium channel receptor mutation. Now, as you have heard, Dravet syndrome at this time is still a clinical diagnosis. So if we then look a little bit more closely at what is the clinical diagnosis of Dravet syndrome, we look back at what was initially described by Dr. Dravet. So the seizure onset of less than 12 months of age. Prior to the seizure onset, an unremarkable past medical history, normal development, and normal neuroimaging. Seizure types that are extremely varied, including both generalized and focal seizures. Subsequent developmental concerns, as well as certain comorbidities, most notable with gait and with behavior. But again, this still doesn't give specific enough information for most physicians to make the diagnosis of Dravet syndrome. You again still have to look a little bit more closely. So that's what we start going through the evolution a bit of the first seizure on. So typically, as we said, the first seizure is less than one year of age with a mean of six months. However, realize there's nothing special about that first birthday where if you have a seizure the day before, you have Dravet syndrome, and if your first seizure is the day after, you do not. Obviously, there's a bit of a spectrum. So while most patients will typically have their first seizure in the first 12 months of life, most physicians will allow a little expansion of that if all the other kind of criteria of the diagnosis is consistent with Dravet syndrome. So you might have had your first seizure at 13 months of age, 14 months, 15 months. It's hard to know exactly where that cutoff would be. But certainly, typically, most seizures begin in the first year of life. That very first seizure is typically a convulsion, either full body, generalized convulsion, or a one-sided hemiconvulsion. However, I have seen patients, plenty, whose first seizures were actually a complex partial seizure, some myoclonic jerks. So again, while there is a typical first seizure, it's not necessarily if you don't have that seizure, you do not have Dravet syndrome. As you can see, that's where this all gets a bit complex. Most of the seizures, initial seizures, are usually prolonged, and they may have a seizure trigger, a fever of vaccination, especially for the first seizure. At this time, the kids have normal development, normal exam. On looking back, very, very carefully, some parents will say, well, maybe their visual interest wasn't quite what it should have been. But in general, for what you, they see to their pediatrician, basic general developmental milestones have been normal. And at this time, they have a normal MRI scan, or at least nothing significant that would account for a seizure, and they'll have a normal EEG. Again, assuming that EEG wasn't right after an episode of status, in which case it might have some slowing. And the typical initial diagnosis is a febrile seizure, or if it was prolonged or one-sided, a complex febrile seizure. And I'm sure many of the families in the audience are aware of this. At this time, usually no medications are begun, although you may or may not have been prescribed some diastat. Then after that first seizure, in that first year, 12 to 18 months of life, the seizures themselves still tend to be convulsive primarily. That's the most dominant seizure type with the full body or the one side of the body jerking. Now, once you start getting more seizures, something that may arise is that alternating unilateral hemiconvulsions. So you come in with one seizure that's, let's say, on the left side of the body, 
and the next seizures on the right side of the body. They alternate between sides. That really is not a common feature, especially for kids who have no reason for their seizures and their MRI scan is normal. And for me, is one of the biggest red flags in a history that a child may have Dravet syndrome. Again, at this time, less frequently, you might have some complex partial seizures or myoclonic seizures. Seizures are, during this time, often prolonged, but not that frequent at, yet. Triggers still include that fever, which may be high or low, vaccinations, a hot environment or hot hyperthermia, as well as an abrupt change in temperature. A lot of times we'll get that history of the first seizure or first couple seizures or a trigger as a child being brought out of a bathtub, that kind of going from warm to like the shiver of the cool environment, or having cold water splashed on them by the poolside. Again, kind of that abrupt temperature change. And at this time, still normal development. However, as we progressed into childhood, after that first year of life, they began having a very active seizure phase. This is with where the seizures really get much more varied, with still the generalized convulsions, the hemiconvulsions. They start getting these focal discognitive seizures, or just that staring, looking off to the side a bit that can last for minutes or much longer. Absence seizures, the brief staring spells, with or without the myoclonic seizures or the quick muscle jerks. The seizures themselves start getting much more frequent. This is typically where you start going through your many different medication trials. Initially, the seizures are still prolonged, but as you had heard from Dr. Dravet, over time they get less so. Seizures where often from the awake state will start to be happening more at night as well. And with this active seizure phase is where some of the developmental, cognitive, motor, and behavior concerns will begin to develop. Um, you know, you can still have children, certainly two and a half, three years of age, with absolutely normal development. And one of the questions I have from parents all the time in clinic is, does that mean that they're, they're going to do very well, that they're going to be fine cognitively? In one study from Italy, where they looked at 22 patients over six years of age, they found that all the kids had a developmental impairment or intellectual disability, ranging from mild to severe. And for those children, all of them had that difficulty noted by five years of age. And their EEG, which was initially normal, now becomes abnormal, with some slowing in the background. And just as your seizures can be generalized or focal, your EEG can be generalized or multifocal discharges and seizures. Then moving on to adolescents and adults, the seizures themselves become less frequent, although I do see in a handful of preteens that their seizures really worsen at this time. So it, everything is variable especially with the clusters of brief nocturnal convulsive seizures. Um, but there definitely is a decreased incidence of prolonged seizures or status epilepticus. Nevertheless, I always do caution families that you just need to be prepared for that. If somebody doesn't have a long seizure for 10 years, that's fantastic. But it doesn't mean you, you let down your guard in terms of it might be still that you would need rescue medicine to be kept with you at all times. As adults, typically, it's brief nocturnal convulsions are the most common seizure type. And I completely agree with Dr. Dravet in terms of they often will have these kind of focal seizures that are really varied in terms of they might have a little, little few jerking on one side or pulling of the face and they can alternate sides. They become very complex. And seizures are still refractory to medications on the whole, with anywhere from 8 to 16% of adults being seizure-free. Again, for a year, they are still on medications. The cognitive ability can range from mild, doing quite well, speaking full sentences, reading, to more typically moderate to severe outcomes that can range anywhere from a conversational speaking ability to being nonverbal. 
Motor impairments, again, initially, as you had heard, being unbalanced, becoming more of a crouch gait, and having behavior issues that can be significant during this time. Now, even though Dravet syndrome is a clinical diagnosis, it is highly associated with an SCM1A variant. Therefore, just a quick note, because I know you're going to have a talk later on the genetics of Dravet syndrome. As you are aware, the SCN1A is a gene that codes for a neuronal voltage-gated sodium channel in the alpha-1 subunit on chromosome 2, with a variety of mutations that can be seen. The, it's highly associated in Dravet syndrome, listed there as 70 to 80 percent, from studies that were back in 2007. I suspect it's much higher than that in our patient population that we have databased over 180, more than 90 percent have a sodium channel receptor mutation. In addition, it's been interesting in the last few years, we've had some families retested and those families that had initially been negative had subsequently had positive tests. So just an FYI, um, likely to improved testing. Nevertheless, not all patients with Dravet syndrome have an SCN1A variant. At this time, it is a clinical diagnosis. And the opposite is also true. Just because you have an SCN1A mutation does not mean you have Dravet syndrome. It certainly has been associated with other diseases or been seen in case reports. So I am stealing this idea completely from Dr. Sheffer, who is in the audience, so I take a bow to you because a puzzle is a perfect way to look at the diagnosis of Dravet syndrome. Each of those things we had talked about, the age of onset, prior history, seizure evolution, seizure type, seizure features, development, motor, comorbidities, EEG, MRI, SCN1A testing, all of those are pieces of the puzzle. And what's important is knowing how to put together those pieces of the puzzle in order to make the diagnosis of Dravet syndrome. For physicians who have seen a number of children with Dravet syndrome, I think we have an understanding of how to put together that puzzle much easier than some physicians who have not seen a lot of patients with Dravet syndrome at this time. And that's why you might have initially seen a doctor who said, your child can't have Dravet syndrome, their EEG is normal or your child can't have Dravet syndrome, their development is too good at this time. So again, it's a difficulty of understanding how to put together all the pieces of this puzzle. I will often say, when I first started seeing children with Dravet syndrome, first 20, 30 patients, I was so struck by how similar they were in some generalities. However, subsequently, after that, I became much more struck at how different all the kids are. Every child is unique, and there is certainly a spectrum to this disease in all areas, in their seizure types, their seizure frequency, how severe it is, in terms of their intellectual ability. I have kids who are in regular classes at school, needing some help and tutoring, but still in regular classes over the age of five, and I have children I see who are nonverbal. So there's a spectrum for behavior, for motor for many of the comorbidities as well, in terms of what medicines they react to. That's why I do like the idea of Dravet syndrome being thought of as a spectrum. Of course, the biggest question is why? How come one child has seizures that are quite easy to control and somebody else has 10 seizures a night? Or why is one child in doing well in school and another is nonverbal? At this time, we don't have the answer to that. As Dr. Dravet described, and I think we have all have seen this, it is not a one-to-one -one match with seizure control in terms of your cognitive outcomes. Nevertheless, we do feel that if your seizures are the best control possible, that will be a help to their development. But clearly, that has to be balanced with what is the side effects of the medications. But having that as an overview of what is the definition of Dravet syndrome, we're going to touch upon a few things in the differential diagnosis of Dravet syndrome. So these might have been some epilepsy syndromes that you all have heard of, possibly ones that your child had been diagnosed with at one point in time. Looking at febrile seizures, genetic epilepsy with febrile seizures plus, focal seizure disorders, 
other epilepsy syndromes, such as benign myoclonic epilepsy, epilepsy with myoclonic atonic seizures, Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. I'm not going to touch more on other metabolic and genetic diseases because that is just too broad of a category. Well, I used to, anytime I saw a patient who I felt had the diagnosis of Dravet syndrome, get targeted SCM1A testing. Now what I do and what a lot of people do will actually get gene panels because there is so much overlap with some of the other genetic diagnosis. However, I do give a little special note out to mitochondrial diseases because early on a lot of people thought Dravet syndrome may be a mitochondrial disorder. Mitochondrial diseases can often have very hypotonic um, association. The kids are very, very kind of loose. Some ataxia with walking, subsequent very difficult to control seizures, some definite similarities. Um, however, mitochondrial testing on the whole is negative. So quickly going through these, febrile seizures are provoked convulsions secondary to fever without evidence of CNS pathology. This is a bit of a catch-22 for physicians because how are we going to know if it's without evidence of brain disease unless you actually test for it? Um, therefore, many kids who come in who are very young will still get a spinal fluid evaluation to prove they don't have any brain pathology or a head imaging study. Um, however, if a child comes in with a very brief, short seizure, they come into the emergency room and then they look absolutely fine and your exam is absolutely fine, certainly the physician may say, okay, you have a febrile seizure and they're allowed to go home. Now, a little typo here, typical age we say is six months to five years. It is considered a complex febrile seizure if there's multiple seizures within an hour, within 24 hours, prolonged seizures greater than 15 minutes, or any focality to the seizure. So as you can imagine, for children with Dravet syndrome, many of them might have come in and actually been diagnosed with a complex febrile seizure if the seizure was prolonged or if that first seizure was a unilateral hemiconvulsion. But the incidence is very high. That's why not every child who comes in with a seizure with a fever for their first seizure gets a gene panel or SCM1A testing. Yet, the recurrence rate for febrile seizures is pretty low, as you can see, and they will stop within five years. As opposed to children who have febrile seizures plus, which just simply means there's something atypical about their febrile seizures. Earlier than six months onset, multiple or continuous seizures past five years of age, even though they still subsequently remit by mid-childhood, or subsequent non-febrile seizures. The idea of an uh, epilepsy febrile seizures plus or genetic epilepsy and febrile seizures plus is really looking at febrile seizures in the realm of the family pedigree. It links the febrile seizures with other seizure to epilepsy syndromes, both generalized and focal. And in these family pedigrees is where you might have the febrile seizures in association with the SCN1A or 2A or other genes. Um, subsequently, these very, the seizure types are much more variable with both febrile seizures, the febrile seizures plus brief non-febrile convulsions, other, general, other generalized seizures, but the prognosis is still very good. Now, occasionally there might be some concerns about somebody who comes in with a focal epilepsy. Focal epilepsy meaning that there, the seizures come from one spot in the brain. Sometimes you can understand why they're coming from the one spot in the brain by brain imaging. If you can see a little scar, a little area of the brain that didn't develop quite normally, then we call it symptomatic. You can see exactly why the seizure is occurring from that spot. Um, if the MRI scan is negative and you can't understand exactly why it's coming from that spot, but you know there must be something there, the imaging's just not good enough to detect, then we kind of call it cryptogenic. These are old terms, um, something that is not actually used anymore, but it's, it's still kind of a good way to think about it from a family perspective. But the idea for focal seizures, all seizures coming from one area. <clears throat> 
Now, that's why for any families who have ever seen me, I'm always so specific on, well, if they come in and you say all their seizures get a turning to the right, head to the right, stiffening, some jerking, and I always say, does it ever go to the left? And that's what I'm trying to differentiate from. Is it possible that you actually have a focal epilepsy, all seizures coming from one area, all the seizures kind of looking the same, or, is it, or do I have evidence by what you tell me historically that seizures are coming from either hemisphere? I've had a handful of patients with Dravet syndrome who actually came to me for a surgical evaluation because their doctors had felt that they had this focal epilepsy and they might be a surgery candidate. And really, I remember the first time it happened, all I needed to do was look at the seizures on the parent's cell phone and see that some of the seizures went to one side, some of the seizures went to the other side, and know that they would not be a focal surgery candidate. Next is a few of the other epilepsy syndromes. The first is myoclonic epilepsy of infancy. This used to be called benign myoclonic epilepsy of infancy, or BMEI, as opposed to the severe myoclonic epilepsy of infancy, or SMEI, which was what we used to call Dravet syndrome. In the myoclonic epilepsy of infancy, there's normal development prior to the onset of seizures in a normal MRI scan. The onset, six months to three years, most commonly one and two years. Seizures are just myoclonic jerks, and they're kind of pretty specific, affecting shoulders, arms, face, eyes, with a little, that's all it is. Oftentimes single, or maybe doublet or triplet of them. When they have their seizures, they get this nice little, one little jerk, another jerk, another jerk. That's why that little kind of doublet, triplet you see. However, there are a percentage of patients who actually will have some infrequent and brief convulsions. And that's where you might get a little bit confused with Dravet syndrome, just in terms of I have in the back of my mind for any child who has convulsions and myoclonic jerks, do they have Dravet syndrome? Here, going back on the history, especially with the onset benign just infrequent convulsions. They aren't going through those multiple medication trials. They don't fit the diagnosis. The seizures themselves are usually pretty responsive to medications, and they will outgrow their seizure tendency. The next is epilepsy with myoclonic atonic seizures, what was also been called myoclonic astatic epilepsy, or MAE, or DUCE syndrome. For these children, there's normal development prior to the onset of seizures in a normal MRI. People use the spectrum of onset very differently. So for any of the physicians out there, I was using a very broad spectrum here of seven months to six years, but by far and away, they peak at about two to four years, in which case you don't have too much of a concern of the, um, the interlapping with the possible clinical characteristics of Dravet syndrome, because Dravet syndrome is going to start within the first year of life and the children with the MAE start later. They have a very specific seizure type that's in the title diagnosis of the myoclonic atonic or myoclonic astatic seizures, which is a jerk and then complete loss of tone, so they drop, so down to the ground, or just a head drop if it's smaller. These can often happen dozens of times during the day, and the children will often have facial trauma from it. However, they do have other seizure types, some more basic simple myoclonic jerks or atonic seizures, as well as apson seizures and some generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Their EEGs have just an irregular generalized spike polyspike wave. Doesn't sound very specific, but actually does have a kind of a specific look to it. And the prognosis is variable. Some kids you put on one medicine, seizures go away, they do fine, development cognition is fine. And you have kind of a second group of kids who are much, much more difficult to treat. And for them, they can have some developmental issues arise. Finally, there's lennox gastaut syndrome. Um, development typically is thought of not normal, even before seizure onset. It's interesting in that this is a little bit of a different syndrome. This, having this syndrome does not tell you why you have neurologic problems or seizures. It is just an epilepsy syndrome. Describe seizure types, EEG pattern, and what might be useful treatments. However, anything that previously had hurt the brain can cause this syndrome. So it might be a baby who had hypoxic ischemic injury or birth injury. 
or somebody else who had meningitis when they were young, um, or a different genetic disease, or you might not ever find an answer as to why they have their difficulties. So it doesn't give a reason for the seizures. It just gives an overall EEG pattern and seizure type pattern that hopefully will help their treatment. As you can see, the onset tends to be a little bit later. What makes a diagnosis, why some people have it as a differential for Dravet syndrome or some, some connecting clinical characteristics, is they often have seizures that are very, they also have seizures that are very difficult to control and really variable seizure types. But again, the evolution of the seizure types are different. The most significant ones for Lennox-Gastaut syndrome being tonic or stiffening seizures, as well as the atypical absence seizures. But they can have any seizure type. They can also have myoclonics or convulsives or partials or atonics. But tonics are extremely significant. They do have a very specific EEG pattern of a slow spike wave. That is something that we do not see in Dravet syndrome. And their prognosis tends to be poor, both for seizure control as well as developmental or cognitive ability. So from my view, thinking of all those, I think it's extremely important to consider Dravet syndrome early. It's, it's an intractable epilepsy syndrome, less than one year of age. It'll have a diagnosis of Dravet syndrome in 17% on one study, and 5% of all epilepsy syndromes in the first year of life. I do SCM1A testing. Anytime they, somebody has recurrent prolonged convulsive seizures, whether febrile or not, so somebody might come in with their first febrile seizure, which some of them might actually be a febrile status epilepticus, a very prolonged seizure, won't necessarily get SCN1A testing there, but I will if they come in after their second one. Again, as we discussed, I get SCN1A testing and consider the diagnosis of Dravet syndrome for anybody who has those alternating unilateral hemiconvulsions with an otherwise unremarkable history and normal brain scan. I will also consider it for anybody who has the myoclonic seizures and convulsions, as well as that just basic clinical history consistent with Dravet syndrome or has those pieces of the puzzles that fit together appropriately. But certainly you do have to consider both, even though it is a clinical diagnosis, you consider both all the clinical features as well as the SCM, SCN1A results. And I think the importance of an early diagnosis of Dravet syndrome, first is you eliminate all that other testing. I used to kind of have patients come in and see me and they would literally have a stack of papers and all the genetic and metabolic testing and everything else that had been done previously. Now when I see patients, the diagnosis is much earlier. People are going to gene panels much quicker for kids who have intractable epilepsy and they are avoiding some of that unnecessary testing. I also think it's very important to get the diagno diagnosis for this reason. You get your parental education and support, which I think is absolutely huge for families because you go through so many different things that I think only another parent who is in that similar situation can really be helpful for you. It helps in terms of appropriate acute and chronic epilepsy treatments, what medicines to take, what medicines not to take, even though at this time we can't say this one medicine will be the most helpful for your child. Um, it certainly gives us some guidelines on what medicines to go to. Since we know intellectual concerns arise as well as motor concerns, even at diagnosis, I usually recommend aggressive therapies or at least very, very close evaluation of development. And finally, as we've seen in the last couple years, the, the early diagnosis or diagnosis of Dravet syndrome is, is important just in terms of research and some focused treatment trials that you might be able to participate in. Um, and certainly if it ever comes to the point where there is a cure or specific therapy for Dravet syndrome, it's helpful to have the diagnosis to be able to have that. And that is the end of my talk. Again, I thank you very much um, for allowing me to come and speak today.